Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Michael Carroll. I am a uh, professor and, and faculty co-director here at American University Washington College of Law. Um, and welcome to our ongoing series, uh, which started out as intellectual property at the Supreme Court. Um, but as the court has now started taking an increasing number of technology cases and social media cases, we've expanded our scope a little bit to include uh, both intellectual property and technology cases. Um, and we're here to discuss the case of Murthy versus uh, Missouri, which is a technology and First Amendment case. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce uh, some legal concepts that will be useful, especially for students in the audience. I'll then um, introduce our distinguished panel, um, and then we will get into the, the substance of, of the case and, and of the argument. So very, very briefly, um, so this, uh, um, I'm, there, there are a set of, uh, there are really three questions presented, uh, whether uh, respondents have Article Three standing, whether the government's challenged conduct um, transform private social media decisions into um, uh, uh, violations of First Amendment rights because they amounted to state action, um, and whether the terms and the breadth of the preliminary injunction as modified by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, is, is proper. Um, I'm going to assume most of the students remember their Article Three standing, that we need a concrete injury that's traceable to the alleged uh, wrong, and that uh, that is an injury that would be redressable by the court. Um, Article Three standing got some attention, so those three that three prong test will will get mentioned more. Um, in terms of the First Amendment principles, um, basic constitutional law, the First Amendment applies to state actors. Uh, private actors can become state actors if their actions are in response to government "quote unquote" coercion, um, and the court has also said that if, oops, sorry, if the government provides such significant encouragement, either overt or covert, that the choice must be in law be deemed to be uh, that of the state. So you're going to hear coercion, you're going to hear significant encouragement as magic words. Um, and also state action is present in the case of joint action between the government and private actors. So you've got three magic words, significant encouragement, coercion, and joint action, all in favor of state action. On the other side is persuasion. If the government is merely trying to persuade or colloquially, colloquially jawbone um, private actors, then that does not cause their response to become state action. Um, in this case, the Fifth Circuit held that the standard for coercion is whether the government compelled the decision by, through threats or otherwise, int intimating that some form of punishment would follow a failure to comply. The Fifth Circuit uh, relied on a four-factor test uh, focused on word choice and tone, the recipient's perception, the presence of authority, and whether the speaker refers to adverse consequences. Um, the Fifth Circuit also uh, announced or, or introduced its standard for significant encouragement, uh, which is whether the government exercised active, meaningful control over the party's private decisions, uh, where control can be shown through entanglement in a party's independent decision making. So that's that's sort of uh, a very quick nutshell, and I just want to make sure you've got the magic words, significant encouragement, coercion, joint action on one side, persuasion on the other. Um, all right, so now let me tell you about who we're going to hear from. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by uh, Chris Beal, who's a deputy, deputy secretary of state of Colorado, um, and uh, his the agency is responsible for the supervision of elections, as well as the regulation of campaign finance and lobbyist activities and various business functions in this in the state. Um, and he is on a brief joined by uh, many of his colleagues from other states. Um, Robert Corn Revere, and, and I'm just uh, doing this um, in alphabetical order, um, is at the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression Fire. Um, and he's part of the litigation team, uh, and they submitted an amicus brief on behalf of FIRE in support of the petitioner in this case. Um, he's a prominent writer and in 2021 published his book, The Mind of the Censor and the Eye of the Be Beholder, the First Amendment and the Censor's Dilemma. Um, David Green is at the Electric, uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation. 
Um, and along with uh, the, the Center for Democracy and Technology, they filed a, a brief in support of neither party. Uh, he's senior staff attorney and civil liberties director, director and has significant experience litigating First Amendment issues in state and federal trial appellate courts. Um, and he's on the steering committee of the Free Express Expression Network, which is uh, the governing committee of the ABA Forum on Communications Law. Uh, Samir Jain is at the Center for Democracy and Technology, also on the same brief, but he has also agreed to uh, kindly to help us understand the U.S. government's position in this case because uh, neither of the party's counsel was able to join us. Um, he is the vice president of policy at the Center of Democracy and Technology, where he leads its policy teams advocating for technology policy and governments, governance that promotes human rights, privacy, free expression, expression, and democracy. Um, uh, Charles Miller, uh, Chip Miller, excuse me, I need water, excuse me. Um, uh, uh, is at the Institute for Free Speech, which filed a, a, a brief in support of respondent. Uh, he joined as a senior attorney in May 2023. Previously, he was Ohio's uh, deputy attorney general, where he directed major litigation. And before joining the state AG's office, um, he served as a judge for the first appellate district of Ohio and also served as a visiting judge on the Ohio Supreme Court. Eric Sell joins us from the Center for American Liberty, where he's an associate counsel and is the inaugural Shulman Legal Fellow um, at the Center. Prior to joining the Center, he clerked for Judge Lauren Smith on the United States Court of Federal Claims, and he worked as a law clerk at the Department of Justice and interned for judges on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and the U.S. Court of uh, Federal Claims. Um, and uh, he had um, uh, roles in Montana prior to uh, to that. Um, <clears throat> Ilya Shapiro um, is at the Manhattan Institute, um, and they filed uh, a brief in, in support of um, the respondent, along with um, REACT-19 and three vaccine-injured injured individuals. He's a senior fellow and director of constitutional studies at, at the Institute. Previously, he was the executive director and senior lecturer um, of the Georgetown Center for the Constitution, and before that, a vice president of the Cato Institute and director of Cato's Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies. Um, Peter Tor Torstensen is um, with the Montana Department of Justice um, in, in uh, Montana, along with some other states, uh, uh, filed a brief in support of the petitioner. So we have states on both sides of this case. Um, he is a deputy solicitor general with the Montana Department of Justice, where he represents the state in legal challenges against the federal government overreach and defends constitutional challenges to state laws. During his time with the Montana DOJ, he's led multi-state amicus coalitions before the United States Supreme Court and several federal courts of appeals. And there we have it. It's a, it's a great panel. I appreciate all of you being able to be with us um, and, and to share your, uh, your thoughts with us. Um, because we don't have either of the parties with us, um, Samir has agreed to give us a thumbnail sketch of the what the government uh, filed in, in its brief. I will give you a very short thumbnail sketch of what uh, the respondents filed, and then we will be off to the races in terms of what did we learn from today's oral argument. Um, and I will do one round where I'll call on the speakers based on the order in which they appear on my screen, and then we'll do a, a more open-ended discussion. So Samir, please take it away. Great, thank you, and thanks for inviting me. So in very brief terms, the government's position, I'll start by just a two-sentence summary. The government is entitled to speak for itself by sharing information, urging action, and participating in public debate, so long as it seeks to inform and persuade rather than to coerce. Its speech poses no First Amendment concern, even if the government officials state their views in strong terms, and even if private actors change their speech or conduct in response. That's really the central point that the government makes. And um, so let me elaborate on that a little bit. 
first, let me begin with standing, which, as Michael noted, was uh, the first uh, the threshold argument that did receive a fair amount of attention at the argument. And really, the government makes two points, two two primary points on standing. First, they say that the injury uh, that the injuries allegedly caused by the past instances of moderation are not fairly traceable to the government as opposed to the platform's own actions. They note, for example, that many of the moderation actions were made before most of the government communications that they challenge. Even one of the um, best examples, according to the uh, respondents that they raised during the argument, involved a situation in which the government sent an email and then the platform took action several months later and the government during the argument you know, argued that, well, there's no way to trace, particularly given that time gap, there's no really way to trace the moderation action back to the government's action, and that if the past, if the injuries aren't traceable to the government's action, then there's no standing. The government also, in the standing context, uh, says there's no redressability, which is, in other words, that the injunction couldn't uh, establish, uh, couldn't uh, address any injury. Um, because it couldn't establish real and immediate threat of future inju injury attributable to the government. They note in particular that much of the complaint co conduct was um, about COVID and the pandemic, that the pandemic has largely abated. And that was an example that they pointed to as to why there's really no threat of imminent future injury, or at least that the petitioner or the respondents hadn't established that. So those were the two main arguments that the government makes on standing, traceability and redressability. And then we get to the First Amendment. And here, you know, the government doesn't dispute that it would have violated the First Amendment if, if it had used threats of adverse government action to coerce the um, platforms into moderating content. But it says it was free to inform, persuade, and criticize. And even if that prompts private and private the private platforms to act, uh, it doesn't transform them into state actors and violate the First Amendment. And according to the government, that's all that was going on here. Now, the government elaborates uh, some by saying, okay, what's coercion? What, what, what is their test for when coercion occurs? And their argument, and this was uh, the phrasing that uh, Brian Fletcher the S from the SG's office used several times during the argument today is, would a reasonable person in the context view the communication as a threat of adverse government action? And if, it, if the answer to that is yes, then that qualifies as coercion. If not, then it isn't coercive. And you know, in, in making that assessment, you have to look at the context, the underlying facts of the interaction, all of which matter. But basically, it's intended to be an objective test um, based on the context as to whether or not um, there was a threat of adverse government action. The government also says, it also concedes that um, significant encouragement, which is the other uh, phrase, primary phrase that um, got used in the court below, that that, that that its equivalent could count as state action, where its equivalent would essentially be positive inducements that overwhelm the recipient's independent judge, judgment and render its decision attributable to the government. In other words, the government in, offers so much of an inducement or a positive inducement or that it basically overrides the independent judgment of the private actor. And here the government says there really is no allegation of such inducements at all, um, that the thrust of the argument really has to do more with the threat side of things. And, you know, what it what it wants to make clear is that in any test that mere persuasion or strong advocacy isn't enough to constitute encouragement. In other words, you shouldn't use encouragement in sort of the colloquial sense of what that word might mean in English, but you really need to have some kind of strong positive inducement that renders the decision not of the platform itself. So those were the main arguments on the merits, just very briefly. And then finally, in its brief, the government also notes that when we're, because we're here evaluating an injunct injunctive relief, that the other factors for the injunction also, according to the government, weigh in favor of um, striking down the injunction, that there's no irreparable injury, that the uh, injunction was overbroad and really has a significant chilling effect because government actors would have to be acting with this injunction hanging over their head, that it contains a lot of vague terms. The effect would be uh, to chill lots of forms of legitimate government speech, and therefore um, the public interest also requires striking down the injunction. So obviously there's a lot more to be said, but I'll leave it there as sort of an opening summary. Great, thanks so much. Um, and uh, you know, this this case is, is a big case with a big record, so I think, and a lot of what the respondents rely on is is uh, facts in that record to support um, that 
<laughs> support the claims. So let me just very briefly say um, the, the record does involve, involve extensive communications between the governments and the platforms. Um, and this is an important sort of uh, uh, underlying uh, element of the of the respondents' claim is that it, it is the volume and the coordination on the government side of these uh, interactions with the platforms that makes this um, uh, case unusual. So, um, on the standing point, um, and um, Basically, the the arguments are the government pressures platforms to censor specific posts, so uh, that would be the most concrete in injury. But in addition, it pre pressures platforms to censor certain topics and viewpoints. Um, and here, uh, a, a lot of the communications involved um, uh, communications about the effectiveness or, or lack thereof of COVID vaccines. Um, and and this was also some of these communications were taking place sort of at the height of the pandemic, um, when there was a lot of energy, let's say, in the society around that topic. Um, government pressures for changes to content moderation policies, so specific posts, specific subjects and viewpoints, and then overall policies. Um, and the injuries are not just the injuries to the right to speak, but also the right to listen. Um, and this was part of the hook for the state's injury is that they want to know what their citizens have to say and, and that the removal of content from these platforms uh, injured their right to know have a representative sample of, of what's going on on social media. Um, all of these injuries are traceable to government pressure. And again, here you need to sort of have a sense for this, the, the volume of communication um, uh, from various different points of, of the government to have a full appreciation for the this part of the argument. Um, and it's redressable because uh, contrary to what the government says, um, uh, the respondent says this is an ongoing course of conduct that started in, in 2017 and continues to this day. Um, and therefore, without injunctive relief, uh, it, will, it will continue. On the First Amendment points, um, the government's coordinated and ongoing uh, campaign to monitor and communicate with the platforms is state action in all three forms. So it's certainly significant encouragement, according to the argument, because it was relentless pressure and deep government entanglement in private decision making. The, the, the volume of communications, the specificity of, of the requests and demands by the government um, provided that level of encouragement that really uh, amounts to uh, overpowering the private decision-making will. In addition, uh, it was coercion from both explicit and implicit threats. One thing you might hear is um, uh, the platforms all rely on Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act as, as their shield from liability for their users' posts. And so one of the elements of, in, the, in, the, in the case is whether the government uh, threatened to change its position or support for Section 230 if if the platforms did not um, comply with the demands uh, for for these different uh, content moderation uh, reactions, and so that would be, that was among the different alleged threats um, that violate the First Amendment. And finally, uh, there was a lot of discussion and, and evidence about talks of partnership between the platforms uh, and the government. Um, and so, at least in some instances, this would amount to joint action, which would also be state action um, uh, uh, under the law. Um, and I, as to the injunctive relief, um, it, it's not overbroad in light of the scope of the government's coordinated action. Again, tying back to this underlying theme of the breadth of government activity is what gives rise to the uh, breadth of, of claims and the breadth of, of, of the relief needed. So the those are the main points for Missouri and, and Louisiana and the five individuals. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, turn first to Ilya um, to give us your uh, sort of uh, take on the argument and any any of these pieces that Samir or I laid out that you want to call more attention to or elaborate on. Yeah, um, I was surprised by the argument in that I'm pretty confident in my prediction that the government is going to win which goes against my side, uh, so I'm not being, uh, you know, puffing my own my own position. But it seemed like uh, none of, or not a majority. There was not a majority 
uh, to agree with you know what our brief and others advocated, uh, you know, including the the, the respondents, that uh, when the private companies cooperate with, collude with um, the government, that they are state actors. That in effect here the uh, um, the government was uh, uh, getting to censor speech uh, in the form of um, deleting posts and accounts, shadow banning, uh, delisting, and all the other tools uh, and 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 uh, lingo of, of the tech world um, at at the behest of even you know and, and the fact that they were um, that they liked the 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 executives or relevant officers liked the government's uh, policies or agreed with them whether. On ideological or other grounds, uh, that that doesn't cure any uh, First Amendment violation. That that position simply did not have a majority on the court. The focus was all on, as we were discussing before we went live, on the Bantam Book standard and what is coercion, and we can we fit this into a classical definition of coercion? Explicitly, do this, or uh, you know, this negative consequence uh, will uh, occur. I think that's. Uh, my personal view is that this is not enough for the digital world, uh, but again, that is not some some place that the justices wanted to go. It could be because, uh, as you said, this is so fact uh, intensive that there's some sort of uh, uh, vacatur with remand for further factual development or decision or something like that. But uh, I don't know. It seems like um, uh, the, 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 there's there was certainly no majority to create some sort of new standard or, or update bantam books for the uh, digital age oh great um eric i've got you next uh thank you professor carroll um i'm a wcl alumnus and this is my first opportunity to speak on a panel with my old law school so this is a real treat for me especially welcome with back a, uh, thank you very much especially with a panel like this very distinguished group of, of uh, lawyers here um I think it's very, very unlikely that the uh, respondents win this case. Uh, and uh, further than that, I, I think it's very unlikely that the significant encouragement concept uh, has any legs, at least uh, in this case, which is uh, very unfortunate. And I think it's going to lead to a significant gap in First Amendment protections for speech, particularly with uh, online platforms, um, which uh, the Supreme Court has recognized are now the modern public square. This is where uh, we all meet, uh, voice our opinions. Uh, government officials debate topics of the day uh, with influencers and, uh, you know, CEOs of corporate America and, and really across the world. Uh, and now you have uh, potentially a situation where, um, you know, the president, uh, the California Secretary of State, any government official can work with these platforms, give them a list of specific individuals who they want uh, banned, who uh, they want specific posts removed. Uh, and as long as there is no threat of adverse government action, um, that is uh, perfectly acceptable uh, under the First Amendment, which I think is very unfortunate is going to lead to a significant amount of government involvement in regulating the types of speech, types of opinions, the types of factual information and scientific debate uh, that uh, you know the, the general public is allowed to see on these platforms. Um, and I think this is really a practical uh, function here. You have a, a, a court that is made up largely of of lawyers who, you know, spent time in government and, and know the challenges of working for the government and uh, addressing challenging public policy issues, uh, especially when you're in a, a crisis situation uh, like a pandemic um, and combating uh, what some believe to be misinformation surrounding elections and, and all of that. Uh, they're they're very challenging issues, uh, and there's an important role for the government to play in providing what it sees as correct information. Uh, but our position in the brief that that we filed in uh, support of the respondents here uh, was that the government is perfectly uh, capable and uh, permitted to voice its opinion, uh, both publicly and privately. Uh, but when it's attempting to regulate private speech, uh, not through threats, but through encouragement, uh, through pressure, uh, then that is impermissible and implicates the First Amendment. Uh, and I think there is a significant case law, um, not on the significant encouragement point, but on the government speech doctrine point that uh, the government speech doctrine is not a tool uh, to wield uh, as, as a, a, a cudgel to regulate private um, activity, to regulate private speech. Uh, and unfortunately, the, the uh, court here ap appeared very skeptical uh, to find a First Amendment violation unless there's a threat 
of adverse government action. Uh, so I'm I'm very uh, pessimistic about how this uh, opinion might read, uh, and I'm hoping uh, that there is some way that the court uh, can dodge the the merits of the question here and and maybe boot this on standing uh, just for preser uh, preserving free speech. I think that would be the ultimate um, best outcome here. Uh, and uh, I think uh, another thing that struck me uh, is also there seems to be a lot of unity among the court um, that this is a challenging case and. Uh, there's just a lot of headwinds for the respondents, uh, you know, given, you know, the, the factual disputes here. I think at one point, Justice Kagan sort of accused the respondents of maybe misleading the court in its brief. Um, so there seemed to be a lot of uh, skepticism among the court for a variety of different reasons uh, that I think uh, present a lot of challenges for the respondents here to win. Um, and I think, again, that's just a, a function of the practical approach that these uh, justices take, given their experience um, just as human beings, but also as lawyers in the government. And I think we're going to see an, op uh, an opinion that reflects that. Yeah, I will say it was interesting how um, Justices Kavanaugh and Kagan both sort of cop to uh, having been on the government side of that. Just Chief Justice Roberts quipped, you know, well, I haven't coerced any, anybody. But speaking of people in government, Chris, I've got you next. Um, and and interested to hear your thoughts as well. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. And um, while uh, Eric uh, says he's uh, disappointed that the court is likely to rule in favor of the petitioners, you won't be surprised to hear that I'm I'm happy. Uh, I agree, actually, with Eric's uh, view, and I think it's the sense, it's the consensus of our panel, that um, the, the position that uh, the government has a need and uh, is not in, in conflict with the First Amendment when it exercises this uh, sort of task of jawboning. Um, one of the things I thought was very intriguing, uh, the uh, SG's uh, Ms. Fletcher um, started his pitch um, with his spin about how this was nothing more than encouragement, persuasion, and, and use the phrase bully pulpit. Um, and uh, the Respondents' Council, um, maybe he was thinking on his feet, maybe he had scripted this out, but in his first two minutes, uh, he concluded by saying this was not the bully pulpit, this was just being a bully. Um, and the what that reminded me about is the phrase bully pulpit actually comes to us from Teddy Roosevelt, um, and when Teddy Roosevelt used the phrase, bully meant nothing about being a bad guy. It meant it was a wonderful thing. It was a, uh, it was a great thing that from the White House, uh, the president could advocate for a policy and could do so uh, from the pulpit uh, of the, the White House uh, uh, created. Um, so I, it, it was interesting how there was an effort to sort of uh, think on your feet, um, but maybe the thinking went in the wrong direction. Um, the, the takeaway that I had from the argument was the extent to which, and once again, as a state uh, government uh, person, although uh, Bob Cornerbeer and, and David will remember me from my days as a First Amendment lawyer, um, the, the myopathy or myopia um, of uh, the federal government is the be all. And of course, the federal government are the, are the uh, defendants. Uh, they are the parties here. We have multiple layers of government. And the rule that the court is going to announce in this case, and I think Peter is uh, likely to speak on this, uh, is going to affect uh, state government, local government, uh, and the amount of jawboning that government ends up doing just as a natural everyday occurrence uh, is uh, is endemic, is, is persistent. Um, and the extent to which uh, I think the Fifth Circuit and the District Court uh, were exposed to what is the reality of uh, ongoing regular contact uh, to try to persuade um, was shocking. Uh, to those justices, um, whereas it wasn't at all shocking to uh, Justice uh, Kavanaugh or Justice Kagan, who saw all of it 
uh, were going on uh, around them. The, the other thing that was intriguing to me, just as a, a sort of tech law point, was the uh, resort by the justices to analogies that have nothing to do with the internet age or the social media platforms. Um, the analogies were to calling up the editor of the Washington Post or talking to the reporter from the New York Times. Um, it, it, and within those analogies was an interesting point that I think we all ought to be alert to. What they were doing was analogizing social media platforms to traditional news speakers. So the, the, within that analogy, you're, they're showing their hand about whether social media platforms are speakers or are they uh, uh, forums? Um, are they the public square or are they the Washington Post? Um, and the interesting part here was that they were assuming uh, that the uh, social media platforms content moderation is just like um, the Washington Post. Um, and one last point as a practice pointer, um, when a justice gives you a hypothetical that is extreme and is pushing you, um, do not uh, take an absolutist uh, view and do not ever say that you are a First Amendment purist. Um, uh, there was an analogy, and maybe someone else can describe the analogy I've used at my time. Um, I thought uh, respondents' counsel may have lost a vote uh, or two um, in the answer on, on that uh, hypothetical. Um, interesting. Uh, well, Peter, since you got name checked, it seems appropriate to let you uh, respond. Fair enough. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I appreciate this. Um, you know, because the state's uh, amicus brief focused on the issue of standing, I'll limit my observations there and kind of let folks uh, touch on the significant encouragement and um, coercion points. Uh, but I think two primary things stood out to me about the argument. The first was that none of the justices seemed all that interested in determining whether or not the states had established standing specifically. Um, and more particularly, given that our amicus brief focused on uh, the nature of the injury, um, they didn't seem very interested in determining what the injury was to the state. So that was sort of a, an initial takeaway. Um, in fact, early on in the argument, Justice Alito asked uh, the government's counsel, Mr. Fletcher, uh, just for confirmation that the one plaintiff rule applied. Um, and from then on, I think almost all of the standing related colloquies uh, focused on the individual plaintiffs. And so um, that seemed to be a bit telling in terms of how um, they may look at some of the standing related uh, questions. And also, um, there was one colloquy between Justice uh, Alito in which uh, he asked about the source of the state's speech rights and whether or not that it was rooted in the, the First Amendment or somewhere else. And uh, the government attorney uh, took that opportunity to say that the states were really just trying to assert the First Amendment rights of their citizens. Um, and this was an, another effort to make an end run around the limits of parents' patriotic standing which was an argument that we attempt to address in our amicus brief, uh, but that thread was essentially unpulled for the rest of the argument. So um, that was, I guess, of note to me. And, and then I think second, many of the colloquies uh, seem to suggest that the court may require a fairly high degree of granularity to establish causation or traceability. Uh, and I think Michael, early on in your summary, you were kind of drawing the distinction between the volume of information or volume of uh, interactions between the federal government and uh, social media platforms and how that may affect the, the standing inquiry. And so it did seem that there was uh, you know, a degree in which, or a sense in which the plaintiffs would need to show how certain requests from government officials to, so, you know, to social media platforms caused the suppression of certain posts. Now the Fifth Circuit obviously did not require that level of specificity. Um, and in cases like this, which do involve many kind of government officials making various requests um, to social media companies to censor or de-boost or um, otherwise various categories of posts, it would be very difficult in the future to establish standing because a lot of these so-called requests occur behind closed doors 
And the individuals whose posts are censored are often unaware of that fact. So um, I guess uh, I'm left wondering um, how the court ultimately resolves the standing question, uh, but that I think that will be of uh, some note. Great, thanks. Um, Bob, I think I've got you next. Okay. Uh, thanks, Michael. And again, thanks for having me be part of this panel. Um, I think one of the interesting comments I've heard, and several people have mentioned this now about how certain justices may have more sympathy with the government because they once worked for the government. And having worked at the FCC, I can't say that uh, I I share that same that same feeling. If, if anything, working for government made me more aware of the fact that government um, uh, operators can abuse that power. Uh, at the FCC, it was known as regulation by raised eyebrow. And uh, so here when we're talking about job owning for social media platforms, it comes more in the form of the old mob boss uh, saying, you got a nice business here. It'd be a shame if anything were to happen to it. Um, needless to say, we filed our amicus brief in support of uh, the respondents um, and arguing that there should be a limit on this kind of um, this kind of government, either uh, coercion or uh, excessive cooperation. I'm not prepared after this argument really to make a prediction one way or the other. And I found this was true after the net choice arguments too. It took me a while, not just to reflect on having been in the courtroom and listened to it, but also to go back through the transcripts and see if uh, uh, I had any different insights after looking at that and thinking about it in more detail. And I think that's going to be required in this case too. While I agree that there was uh, quite a bit of focus on causality and redressability, I, I think there was an awareness among the justices that this is a different environment from the um, from standard media uh, um, uh, questions, uh, just because of the nature of uh, um, the number of interactions there are. And I think there was some concern about just how um, pervasive the number and extent of the contacts were between various administration actors and the social media platforms, which is something you do not have uh, in uh, the world of traditional media. Uh, I believe uh, uh, both Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Alito asked questions saying, so if you had the government sitting in on the editorial board uh, meetings of, say, the New York Times or the Washington Post, and certainly, as uh, Chris mentioned, that's different from how social media platforms operate, but the principles are the same in separating government from um, uh, private editorial decisions. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in an ultimate decision. It's also important to recognize that this case is not being decided in isolation. And while it presents a number of challenges for the court to overcome, it's also part of a series of cases involving the relationship between government and social media platforms where these questions are being probed in the in the net choice cases. I think it's a good thing that, uh, by the way, that uh, the underlying assumption appears to be among the justices that these platforms are independent entities that have their own First Amendment rights. Um, and it's also decided, as was noted earlier, along with uh, NRA versus Volo, which looks at job owning in a non-social media context. The focus there is more on the Bantam, Berks, Bantam Books coercion point. And I do agree that counsel for the state of Louisiana could have done a better job of trying to help the court find some limiting principles and some lines to uh, um, identify when cooperation is too extensive or what the line is between persuasion and coercion. But I think what that means is it's going to be a more challenging job for the court to find those lines somewhere in this argument. Uh, Hopefully it will because, you know, administrations change. This is not a partisan issue. Whoever happens to be in power and, and, and pulling those levers behind the scenes, uh, should there should be some way to impose some constitutional limits on it. And Bob, can I just, since you, you have been plowing in these fields for a long time, could you just remind the audience what the the coercion in the Bantam Books case was so that, I mean, that's sort of the reference point, the legal reference yes. point against which all of cuts, this discussion took place. It, it cuts both, across both cases. Um, 
Bantam Books is a 1963 decision of the Supreme Court involving an effort by the state of Rhode Island to regulate books that were unsuitable for minors uh, rather than regulate directly. Uh, the state established a commission for morality in youth that would come up with lists of titles that uh, it thought were unsuitable and then would circulate those lists to bookstores in the state and say, are you still selling this book? Now, an, an interesting background to that is that Bantam Books in 1963 came after a series of decisions by the Supreme Court establishing, really for the first time, clear First Amendment doctrine and clear First Amendment lines that limited the ability of governments to regulate books of that sort. In 1948, it decided Winters versus New York that struck down a, a law, a New York law from the 1880s that was passed to regulate dime novels and other salacious literature. Uh, it followed uh, Butler versus Michigan in 1957 that said that states can't reduce the adult population to reading only what is fit for children. And so what happened is that uh, the state of Rhode Island decided to pull an end run around the First Amendment since direct brute force regulation was barred, seemingly barred by the First Amendment. It would adopt this sort of novel way of circumnavigating, circumventing the, uh, the First Amendment limits. That's what we're seeing in internet regulation today. After Reno versus ACLU, after the precedents that followed that, and we had developed a robust First Amendment jurisprudence protecting the internet and social media from government intervention, we are now seeing um, efforts of various kinds to um, circumvent that by either calling what they're doing as regulation of business, regulation of conduct, anything but regulation of speech. And this behind the scenes jawboning is just another example of ways in which governments try and avoid the law. Okay, um, Samir, since you talked first, I'm gonna let David have, a, uh, have his say and then you get to close us out on this round. Go ahead, David. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I think the, 20,000 page elephant in the room during the argument is the record in this case. And I I think what I saw from the court was looking for a, a path to not have to read that record and go through it with a fine tooth comb and make its own de novo factual, uh, factual determinations about whether whatever line they set certain communications, uh, either individually or in toto, cross that line. And I thought there was a lot of questions about, well, if we're just on stand, if we're just on standing, what's your best, you know, what's your best case for traceability? And if we find clear error on that, like that's enough. And and I really got a sense from at least at least three of the justices looking for a path to not have to make factual determinations. And I do think if you consider that this case was heard with another jawboning case, another Bantam Books case in, in the afternoon or immediately after, in in uh, in NRA versus Vulo, that there is a possibility that they decide Vulo on a fairly traditional Bantam Books holding, because Vulo is there's an evidentiary record that is much more clear coercion, um, and they determine this on, and they determine this on standing, and they dismiss it on on that basis. I, I think they're going to be reluctant to to revise the Fifth Circuit's test either one way or the other, and send this back for additional uh, you know, factual review by the Fifth Circuit. I don't think they they seem to be you know, some concern. I, you heard it from a few justices, I think most notably from Justice Sotomayor when she accused uh, the respondent's brief of being uh, misleading and, and deceptive that, um, that the courts below had not made fair uh, fair evidentiary findings regarding the ultimate applying, had not made fair findings applying uh, the, the coercion test. And there were several um, amicus briefs that, that picked this apart. So they had plenty to help them there. So I, I think, and I, you know, I, I say that, I, I, of course, I, I don't usually make predictions. And so this is not prediction. I'm just giving commentary. Um, and I would actually be quite disappointed if that happened, because I think we really need a, we really need a First Amendment decision here. Uh, I think we really need one that, um, I think the most important thing that comes out of this case is just a government having a better sense of what its limitations are. And I mean, I know where I'd like those limitations to fall, which would be to place greater limitations and actually uh, to have the coercion test not require um, 
uh, the uh, uh, sort of explicit penalty attached to it. But I think the most important thing is that we have some test come out of it, some something more definite and more specific. And I don't know that we're going to, I think, unfortunately, we might not get that. So um, so that's my, and I think what we've seen with this court, uh, at least, I mean, especially in the First Amendment cases that I follow closely, we saw this, you know, at the end of last week when the when the decisions of Linky versus Freed and O'Connor Ratcliffe versus Garnier came out, is this court looks for opportunities to roll the ball down the middle and and I think it might I think it might do that here. And I, I did see some I, I'm not sure the court wants to go all the way with the Solicitor General's very, very narrow interpretation of Banta books is that you must have a you must be an explicit penalty uh, attached to it. I think they'd like there to be more than that. I think that whether that's you know, whether that's such encouragement or 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 something else or whether that's the sort of some type of borrowing, some type of collaboration element from joint action. Um, or, or you know, some level of inducement. I, I think they'd like to have it a little broader, but they certainly weren't willing to go as far as uh, the respondents were saying, which was that really any ask, you know, any any stated request, specific request, would would cross the line. Um, although the respondents did say that's our you know, that's our sort of pure ask, but you know, we you know, we'd be li we'd be willing to go a little a little farther. So I I, I think given that and given what happens if they announce a different test and then their test actually have to go through the record? I really think they'll avoid that at at, at all costs, and, and I hope I'm wrong. Um, so then I've got Chip and then Samir. Chip, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so this is going to be basically a seven-two decision on the outcome, uh, uh, with no idea, you know, what the reasoning is going to be. Um, but today was uh, today felt like an error correction day at the court, which is pretty unusual. So. Um, I'm going to talk about the other case a little bit, uh, Vulo, uh, which was argued today, also was uh, a lot about bantam books. And there, everyone agreed, all the parties, all the justices, that, yeah, this, this law is solid. There's a four-part test out there that's being applied by the lower courts, and that's all good. Um, so, you know, I, I think that we know what the bantam test is going to be. But in this particular case, um, there are so many ways to uh, to get to that result where the government wins. I'm not convinced we're going to have any type of majority opinion here. Um, there are judges, uh, there are justices that are interested in kicking this thing on standing. There are justices that are interested in kicking this and saying simply there's no preliminary injunction remedy that's available. Um, and then you have some that are essentially kind of looking at the facts and saying, you know, the facts just aren't here. Um, and, you know, so that seems like, uh, you know, when, when you have all of that of hodgepodge of reasoning and thought, you know, I don't know exactly where they get to uh, consensus. Um, you know, now there were two justices, um, you know, who uh, for all of us free speech warriors out there, you know, kind of had our backs a little bit uh, and, you know, wanted to to look at those issues some and, and talk about it. Um, but, um, you know, uh, as I think uh, maybe it was Chris uh, indicated, um, you know, there was uh, there was some pretty uh, uh, hypotheticals there that were pretty extreme. Um, that um, that the uh, advocate uh, for Louisiana did not give an opportunity of our, our, did not take the opportunity to articulate limiting principles. Um, when uh, you know you're asked, hey, can the government uh, tell you know TikTok or you know Twitter to uh, to take down videos that encourage kids to jump off of high buildings? They said no. Um, <laughs> when Justice Barrett said, hey, you know, if there was um, you know say, personal threats to your personal safety, um, you know, could the FBI, you know, ask that doxing of your personal address not happen? Now, keep in mind, Justice Barrett has spoken about this issue, like in the public and, you know, how she behaves in grocery stores and the like, you know, something that's very near and dear to her heart, you know, and that's when he gave the First Amendment absolutist answer. I'm a First Amendment absolutist, very uncomfortable for me, but, you know, uh, you know, that th 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 that is not how you win a case, um, you know, and th there was an opportunity here for a limiting principle uh, and the limiting principle is political speech. Uh, you know, so if, if, if you if you want to say that, you know, uh, we're going to have a rule here that says that if the government is asking for speech to be taken down, you know, that's a red flag right away. That red flag really could apply in a political speech context. Um, but uh, but he went all the way to say it applied to all speech. 
um, and lost any any opportunity to get uh, middle justices here. Um, and you know, so, but you know, th that said, I kind of view this right now as a lost opportunity. Um, but I'm not convinced that there's necessarily going to be any bad case law that comes out of this. There may be bad conduct that comes later because of the lesson that the government learns, which is, yeah, you can get away with it. Um, you know, but uh, but that's uh, for a later result. And just just finally, um, th there are two things that uh, the justices said that I wanted to highlight. Uh, you know, one, uh, Justice Jackson was talking about how, you know, in this public health emergency, it was really, really, really important to get this out there, you know, because it was for the public health. But at the same time, you know, these were disputed facts at the time, right? You know, whether it's good to be vaccinated, how long it's going to last, you know, should you vaccinate kids? Th th those were political debated facts at the time. And I don't feel that that was highlighted. And then uh, Justin, Justice Kagan may have given us a little bit of a preview of, uh, of what's going to happen with MetChoice or maybe just how she hopes it comes out because she said a couple of times that, well, remember, this is, you know, th th this is the platform speech. Um, you know, so uh, I looked at the, around the court to see if we reacted to that. They're, they're, everyone was stone faced, but uh, but that's what she said. So we'll see. Very interesting. All right, Samir, go ahead. Sure, I know we're reaching the end. A lot of people have said a lot of things I would have said, so I'll just keep it brief. Look, I, I think on the merits, this is a tough case in terms of how you write it, um, because on the one hand, you know, this is a point that we made in our brief. Um, I think evaluating whether a particular communication is coercive or whatever the test is, is a very fact specific inquiry, because it depends on a lot of things, who the speaker is, what exactly the content was, um, and other facts. Uh, and I think everyone agreed with that. You, you saw that evident in the argument today. And um, so writing something that writing an opinion that provides clarity, which I think is important, because I think you don't want the vagueness that ends up chilling legitimate speech. Um, but at the same time, recognizing how fact specific it is, I think is actually a really hard assignment. And, you know, at the end of the day, if we think of it from a practical perspective, it can't be the case that the right answer here is that every time the government has communication with a platform, someone runs into court and then you adjudicate whether that particular communication was coercive or not coercive or whatever the test is. And so, you know, from a policy standpoint, there has to be a better answer than repeated litigation over and over again about any communication. And that, I think, requires a clear test. And um, while I think respondents, I, I agree with uh, what a number of people have said, that respondents went way out on a limb in terms of, you know, saying, yeah, they can't even ask to take down the, you know, the, the speech about jumping out windows uh, in that hypothetical. I think the one virtue it had, it was a clear test. He was basically saying, if it's First Amendment protected speech, then they can't ask to take it down. Um, that, I think, for the various reasons that folks have talked about, isn't really a workable or uh, reasonable test. But I think finding a, both a reasonable test and one that's actually applicable and that actually practically works is a really difficult um, assignment. And that may be a reason that they end up just deciding the standing question and punting all the rest for a later day. But, uh, but I do think um, that, that to me is the real challenge here. Interesting. So a couple of comments. One, I mean, we've been doing these series. So, so the one constant appears to be when they take a social media case, the argument will go at least 45 minutes longer than scheduled, because that is that has been the truth. Um, but I, what I also find interesting is a lot of cross references among these social media cases. So look backs to uh, the, the net choice and Sort of, uh, so I guess we don't have a lot of time for a broad thematic conversation, but but one theme, anyone who's got like really quick reactions is, um, you know, the other point was, well, wait a minute, we're talking about these large tech companies and, and you're saying that they're these helpless uh, beings who when the government says jump, they jump. Uh, I mean, we have lots of evidence of them not doing that. And in so many other contexts, we're very worried about their power. Um, so characterizing them as being sort of uh, so so pliant with the the government pressure just doesn't seem to stand up in 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 the way we characterize them in these other contexts. So, I mean, it seems to me like there are these two. One was the intensity of the communications did have a COVID specific element to it. So does that mean kick this case because it's not representative? And the other is is there something about the tech platforms that 
will get, give the court some reason to say coercion has to have some different meaning in this in this era or in this context. So jump ball, anybody who wants to uh, yeah, raise sure. their hand. So, right. So, I mean, one of the issues that you have here is that because it's not their speech, they don't care as much. You know, they're not interested in defending, you know, some rando uh, who's putting up stuff. And so the idea is, is that, you know, if you can, you know, get points with the government by taking down someone's speech, that's not yours. You don't care. Um, that was, and that's the difference. That was one of the points that um, the court addressed in Bantam Books, saying one of the reasons why uh, this is a problem is because if you put pressure on the on the booksellers, uh, you know, they might not have as strong an interest in in uh, protecting any one title. And so it's important to find a constitutional principle there that uh, that speaks to that. Now, with respect to social media, Justice uh, Gorsuch did ask a question that went to that, asking whether or not whether the industry is concentrated or not is a factor in favor of finding that they're easy to, to coerce or not as easy to coerce. Um, it's uh, uh, one that sort of puts allows the government to get everyone in one room and uh, get them moving in the, in the same direction if you have a, con a concentrated in industry, uh, which makes the First Amendment problem all the more difficult. I mean, I just think narrow coercion is not the right, should not be the right test here. Um, the, the moment that struck me from argument was when uh, the uh, Louisiana Solicitor General was talking about the tech companies uh, clearing their actions or checking uh, whether what they'd done, you know, remember when we when we discussed and you said like these posts were troublesome and these people should be downgraded. Well, we did this, this and this. And this is enough to accomplish the goal. I mean, look, there's no coercion there in the sense that they weren't being forced to do this. They wanted to effectuate government policy that makes them a government agent. It makes them a state actor. That seemed pretty clear to me or to me. But if you're going by a narrow coercion standard, then of course, that's not going to fit. Yeah, I, I I think that's right, and I I think I think what's interesting is whether there will be, I don't think there's five justices, but I, I think we might get some side opinions that talk about more about uh, that they'd be receptive to a joint a better joint or to a joint action case, one that was really pled and framed as a joint action case, and where they really got to look at collaboration and cooperation in a different framing. I don't they didn't seem quite comfortable the way it was framed. Um, in this case, and even the way the Fifth Circuit framed it, which is really is just one element of of control. Th I think in terms of good signs, though, I, this was you know we've been we've had a lot of social media cases, and I think we got through this whole term without the court you know dropping some line about how like they don't understand this stuff and they're the worst nine people to. So I actually think they understand content moderation now. And they understand how it works, and and that's I you know so you know pats on the back to all the amicus briefs that spent you know, two years trying to teach them how the whole thing works. Cause they, they, I think they actually get that now. Okay, anyone else final? Well, I, just one point on the joint action question because I thought yeah. that was one thing that led to confusion in the court today. And that is while this was pre the question presented, question number two presented by the uh, uh, by petitioners, was whether or not the social media platforms became state actors when they were engaged in this kind of activity. That wasn't the case that was argued below. The case that was argued below was whether or not there was uh, excessive cooperation or entanglement in, in uh, making these decisions or excessive encouragement and uh, excessive uh, um, coercion. And so there were no um, social media platforms that were defendants in this case as if they were becoming state actors. Uh, the um, defendants below were all, well, <laughs> most of them were, were government officials, and uh, the ones that were not government officials were dropped out when the, when the injunction was narrowed by the Fifth Circuit. Uh, and so I think the, the focus properly was on um, excessive cooperation and on uh, coercion, uh, and it was not a case about joint action. <laughs> Can I just, I mean, even if it runs over a minute, I just did want to ask, you know, what's left? So the the significant encouragement, you know, branch, I mean, Justice Jackson tried to say, well, isn't, isn't that just a different form of coercion? And so really, isn't it all coercion up and down? 
but that's just one justice. But but I didn't hear entanglement wasn't getting any traction. Encouragement wasn't getting a lot of traction. So is that in terms of the overall sort of law in this area, uh, is it really now coercion up and down, or or is there a space for the encouragement uh, line? But it this is not it. I think there's still space for encouragement. I just don't think the facts were there on the encouragement side, right? So if the government said, if you take this down, we'll approve your application on some unrelated matter, I think that would probably constitute uh, significant encouragement, you know, again, depending on all the other facts, sufficient to um, cause a cause a First Amendment issue there. But I, I just don't think this wasn't argued. I don't think there were a lot of facts here to suggest there were that kind of positive inducements going on. And the government certainly as a legal matter conceded that yeah a significant and you know a significant enough inducement could be the uh, yeah they called it the flip side of coercion but they acknowledged that could be sufficient but they you know their line was they're really on the facts here right. right and you won't see anything out of the majority on that in this case uh you may see something in the dissents uh, about what to do about it and then also again i think you'll see more in vulo about the actual law there and then finally, uh, if you if uh, students uh, want to know what the, the court should have done here, take a look at my Bloomberg uh, editorial. <laughs> Great. Well, we've hit the hour. Thanks so much. This was very enlightening. It was, uh, you know, these 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 arguments have been interesting to listen to because you really feel the justices. I mean, they're bringing their priors, but then they're really trying to map them onto this new world that I agree with David that they've gotten a better handle on it. Um, but they just see how many different sort of when you pull on this thread, another one comes loose. And so they're they're quite cautious. I think the link, I, my own sense is there's going to at least be an initial attempt to get something that I, don't, I think there are probably two justices that won't play along. But a seven justice majority on something really narrow, a sort of linky style, just so so we can sort of establish the simple principles um, and then build from there. But We'll see. Maybe this case is not the vehicle for doing that um, because of the fact-specific uh, nature. Um, anyway, it's been great. Thank you all so much. This uh, The recording will be available in a few days. We have to do some processing and get the cap closed captioning, but we'll send the link around when it's posted. Um, and um, I know my students are very uh, grateful for your time and energy in explaining this. Um, and so let's give uh, audience, we can't see you, but I'm going to, on behalf of them, <laughs> give you all <laughs> a big round of applause um, and have a great evening, everyone. And thanks so much.